speech. Freedom of speech. As Americans, freedom of speech is one of our most coveted and cherished rights. However, certain things are better left unsaid. This is bad. Cer certain things are better left unsaid. Uh, this project is definitely one of those. Uh, my name is Keith, and standing to my immediate left, this is Argus, and again, next to him, that is DJ over there. Uh, collectively, we are known as Chung's Donut Shop, and today we'll be presenting on the Luna Correspondence Protocol. Okay. We're going to ask at this point that you reserve all questions to the end of the presentation. Time permitting, we will have a Q&A session. If we do run out of time, then you're more than welcome to approach us at any time during the con with any questions you may have. We're going to ask that you pay... Okay, I'm sorry, these mics suck. Okay. We're going to ask that you pay particular attention to the methodologies behind the actual software as they're not only applicable to our own implementation but any one of your own. This is a flexible security scheme. It's not any particular tool. It's not, uh, it doesn't require client server software. It's basically a collection of methodologies used to achieve anonymity and security over a public network. Can everybody hear? I'm getting a lot of blank stares, like... Okay. All right, most of you are probably wondering why we're in fact here today. Well, the security of our world as we know it is at stake. The Lunar Correspondence Protocol will help to... I don't know why that mic's up now. Hello. Can we just use that one and pass it? I think, I think that's the best way to do it. Technical difficulties. I don't know why this mic just worked. It just worked. Maybe it needs... Let's look at it. On the back. It doesn't interfere with 2.4, right? No. Okay. Making sure. So yeah, Bluetooth phone. Hmm. Okay. The security of our world as we know it is at stake. Uh, Luna Correspondence will help to safeguard your constitutional right to freedom of speech under the mounting pressure of an ever-increasing governmental bureaucracy poising itself to become the big brother of tomorrow. However, our project uh, the nature of our project may lend itself to possible abuse by malicious users, industrial saboteurs, and perhaps even terrorists. That stated, we are still confident that the pros of our, con of our project far outweigh the cons in providing three key features. Those features are secure communication, communication, and anonymous communication. Abstractly, the Luna Correspondence Protocol is a revolutionary new protocol used to anonymously transmit and receive data securely across the internet. The Luna Correspondence Protocol is based on the finite improbabilities of vast random data dispersal and exploits properties in IP to accomplish a portion of its goals. Uh, essentially, that means we're using the internet as is. No special client server software is required for a full implementation of the Luna Correspondence Protocol. Uh, finally, when coupled with the latest encryption technologies and our in-house Chung's Donut Shop developed advanced permutation engine, the Luna Correspondence Protocol achieves a level of security unsurpassed by any other protocol or privacy scheme. Okay, first off, I'm going to apologize for any technical difficulties with sound. If you can't hear me, just yell. I'll talk louder. Hold the mic closer. Okay, first thing we're going to discuss is a tool called Loki. Okay, during the initial stages of Luna's development, we're often asked if it was just a revamp of the Loki tool. For those of you that don't know what Loki is, Loki is a tool which claims to use ICMP to create a stealth channel to communicate through firewalls. Um, that's really the only similarity between our implementation and Loki. Um, we chose to use ICMP traffic. The reason for this is a lot of the same reasons they chose to use it for Loki. It easily passes through a lot of consumer firewalls. Okay, not all, but many. Uh, secondly, it's a connectionless protocol, which aids in our anonymity. And third, and most importantly, it's blindly relayed by uh, the vast majority of public hosts on the internet, and that's just the way the ICMP works. To start off, we show you a typical ping transmission or ICMP uh, transmission. Basically, you have your packet. The data of this packet contains, say, a system time, ticks, whatever. You're going to use this data in a calculation to uh, determine the round trip it took for your data to get from one point of the internet to another. So we send it out into our network. It goes off into the internet, and it goes to our first arbitrary host. We'll call it host A. Okay. Now, the only thing that host A can do to validate where this packet came from is it trusts the source address in the header. Okay, it's a connectionless protocol. Therefore, there's no validation performed. So all it does is it looks at the source address. It says, okay, this came from here, and it sends it right back 
to, in this case, transmitters network. Okay. To accomplish the anonymity portion of our implementation, we're actually going to deceive the internet. And the way we're doing this is we're making use of that flaw in ICMP, the lack of a validation scheme. Instead of putting our source address for it to reply to, we're going to put the target host address. Okay. So we'll show you here. Our data is at our uh, transmitting host. It's all ready to go. It's prepared. It's been ordered. Uh, we're going to get a lot more into what we're doing to prepare this data later on, but I need to understand now that's ready to go. Okay. First thing we do is we send it off into our own network, and you notice one packet staying behind. The reason for this is to uh, show a delay, which we're going to get into later. Just take note of it now. So it's going from our network, you know, firewalls and egress filtering permitting, out into the internet where it's routed to two separate hosts. Okay, we're choosing to use unique hosts, spread this data all over the internet to aid in avoiding the creation of a pattern. That's what we're really what we're trying to do here. Now, as far as they're concerned, these packets came from the receiver network because that's all they have to go by is that source header. So what it does, it says, you know, good enough, it sends this data intact right back to the receiver's network. Now, you notice it's not going to the receiver's computer itself. This is because, number one, a lot of uh, masqueraded routing systems will not allow it to go to a host that didn't put the request in queue. Secondly, if you've got a lot of ICMP traffic going to one host on your local network segment, you're going to know something's up. It's going to set off a flag. It's going to create a pattern that's going to be traced and noticed. And we want to avoid that at all costs. So what we're doing is our receiving host is actually promiscuously sniffing all ICMP traffic on the network for during this particular session. Okay? It's going to be collected and parsed later, but for right now it's just sniffing everything. Okay, we've got our last packet coming into the network. It goes back in, it's reordered at the uh, other laptop, and we basically send our data across the internet. Okay? To do this, we're utilizing two layers of spoofing. Now, obviously, there's going to be situations where you can't spoof the MAC address, you can't spoof the IP address, whatever. This is all applicable to any particular scenario. You can add or remove any component of this scheme as needed per your situation. Okay? You can't say you can just break it by filtering out MAC addresses, because you could simply remove that component, use everything else, and remain relatively anonymous. So what we're doing is we're actually changing the hardware address of the card. Again, if somebody's looking on our local network and they see all this traffic going to all these different hosts on the internet and they're coming from different addresses, everything else not on our network, but it's coming from the same MAC address, you're able to pinpoint what card or what boxes came from. It's also going to create a pattern. You've now flagged all these packets with your MAC address and now you know which packets are part of this scheme. Second, we already touched on it, is the IP address spoofing. This, uh, again, facilitates a relay and uh, makes it makes us able to uh, basically remain anonymous on the transmitting end. Okay. Now we're going to get into inefficiency. Now why wouldn't we want to be efficient? Why wouldn't you want to transmit your data across the internet in the quickest, most efficient method possible? Well, we've added this relay and that's already at a level of inefficiency to everything. It's not a quick protocol at all. It can be, but in the most you know, implicit implementation it's not. Secondly, when you send data from point A to point B, let's say I am a uh, in Southern California, and our goon back here is in New York, and we want to communicate back and forth. Yeah, he's not looking at me, okay. And we want to communicate back and forth. Somebody who thinks that we might be talking to each other could easily pick a note along this path, predict where our data is going to go through. We're giving these people a lot of credit. We're not assuming it's just your average jackass trying to sniff our traffic. So what we're going to do is we're, again, with that relay, we're avoiding the creations of patterns, and we're making it a lot more inefficient for this to go across, and a lot less reliable as well. But again, we're going to get into re reliability later. Okay. What we've done to prepare our data before we send it out is we've done several things. Now again, you could probably encrypt your data, send it out through the relay. 90% of the time you're now anonymous and relatively secure. But we're going to give these people a lot of credit. We're going to say our snooping party is a paranoid military, a government, a country, whatever, that has unlimited resources and deciphering and collecting our data. Okay, we're going to give them a lot of credit because we want true anonymity. We don't an want anonymity to the point of the knowledge of the person snooping our traffic. So what we're going to do first thing is we're going to reorder the data. Okay, we're going to take our packets and our sequence, shuffle up, put it out of order. reason for this is we're trying to avoid the creation of patterns. Okay? If you send data across the network in order, and it gets, or even if you send over the period of a year and a half with this delay, you're still, if somebody can guess when you started, and when it ended, they're going to be able to at least assemble these in sequence. It's going to aid in the deciphering and reordering these packets. So we want to avoid that. Okay? Second thing we're going to do is we're going to inject false positives. Okay? Even with reordering and delay and everything else, in a scenario where all data is valid, laws of probability state it will eventually be reordered and deciphered. So we're going to inject false positives into the thing and the 
engine that we're going to use to do this, we're going to assess later. Okay? And third, that data uh, delay that we already discussed before. Now, in our implementation, we chose to have two values, a minimum and maximum delay time. Okay? So that could be anywhere from like one millisecond to five years. So the first packet obviously goes off instantly. The next packet may come 30 seconds. The next one may go a year. The next one may go in a week. Now, obviously, this isn't feasible for most communications, but it's just an example of how it works. It's going to send anywhere in between these times, not at a random set interval, but a truly random value. Okay? Again, all this is doing is avoiding the creation of the patterns. Okay? On top of this, we're applying cryptography. Now, again, with unlimited resources and a company or government that has a time and sufficient uh, power to do this, cryptography eventually will be cracked. Okay? Doesn't mean it's going to happen anytime soon. Doesn't mean it's going to happen in a year, but eventually it's going to be cracked. Okay? We want true security and anonymity. So what we're doing is we're saying crypto isn't valid as a primary means of securing communication, as a sole means of securing communication. However, it's far from trivial because when applied over the whole scheme, it severely complicates the efforts to reorder and decipher the data. Okay, you have encrypted garbage coming across the network. It's going to be real difficult for you to figure out how it's coming across and how it's being deciphered. And all this we use in our implementation in a variety of ways. We'll get into that later. But all these methods applied, adding or subtracting any of them, could be applied to any security scheme. This is how you're going to remain anonymous. You're going to avoid these creation of patterns regardless of how you're implementing it. Okay, and we're moving on to security with uh, Keith here. Yes. Okay, as, the Ar as Argus just so eloquently stated, um, we're basically trying to avoid the creation of patterns and complicate all efforts to reorder and collect our data. Now we're going to do this by using a mathematical permutation function P, accepting two arguments N, the total number of packets, and R, the set of packets composing real data. That is eliminating bogus packets. Uh, as was discussed earlier, we're also injecting bogus packets across the network. To figure the number of bogus packets, one would just take R and subtract it from N. Now, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty mathematical details behind this function, as that's far beyond the scope of this lecture here. But what I will explain is the result of this function. See, the result of function P, is, or the number as a result of inputting two variables, N and R, is the total number of permutations required scenario to reorder our data effectively. So let's go ahead and plug, some uh, plug and chug some numbers through this function. We'll start with 60 and 10. 60 packets total and 10 packets composing real data. That leaves us with 50 bogus packets being inje injected across the network. Uh, we end up with a number 2.735898472 times 10 raised to the 17th power. Uh, that's an extremely large number for just a relatively small set of packets. Again, we said we injected 60 packets over the network. That's the total number of permutations required given the worst case scenario to correctly order our data. Uh, this function, as you can see here, is exponentially growing. We'll go ahead and up the ante just a little bit, and we'll inject 100 packets total across the network. Uh, 80 packets consisting of real data. That leaves us with 20 bogus packets. Well, my trusty TI-83 can't even comprehend the total number of possible permutations for that sort of a data. Uh, 100 packets, just to put this in perspective, 100 packets could be easily sent in maybe a paragraph, maybe four or five sentences. Again, very easy to do. For simplistic form here, we've gone ahead for the visual learners and represented this uh, in basically what we've done here, just to, just to show how insanely difficult this is to do. We're going to assume a relatively bare network. That is a pristine network, basically blank and devoid of any traffic. We're going to go ahead and inject packets across the network uh, eliminating all the bogus packets. We're just going to send the real data here. We'll send one packet, one character, the letter L. That leaves us one possible permutation. Again, just the letter L. Two packets, two characters, the letters, or the, uh, the letters L and U. That leaves us with two permutations, L, U, or U and L. Three packets, three characters, L, U, and N. Six total permutations possible between those three characters. Four packets, four characters, four letters, L, U, N, and A, and now you're looking at 24 different permutations. Again, it's exponentially increasing. Okay, so if prying eyes are unable to correctly order our data here, you're probably wondering how the receiver is able to do this. Well, the receiver and the transmitter both have random number generators seated by the same value, basically meaning that they're able to generate the same random numbers in succession one after another on, on either side. 
Now, how the seed is transmitted between the two is solely up to the communicating parties. Uh, very elaborate schemes, such as perhaps writing that seed down on an index card, passing it physically where the other party then memorizes it, burns it, ingests it. It's all up to you. Or even more overt methods such as you know PGP, like private public key passing, or even you know like uh, any other handshaking. Which, but those are all susceptible to like, man in the middle style attacks. Now what we're going to do is we'll line all of our data here up at the receiving order. We've got our start sequence, our stop sequence, and then three packets C, D, and S. We're going to push them across the network. We've got C, D, S, and two bogus packets along with the start and stop sequence. We're doing this at random intervals, uh, random times, and completely out of order across the network. What the receiver's going to do now is sit back, receive all the data as it comes in, and wait for two packets. The receiver's going to look for the start sequence and the stop sequence. Once the start and stop sequence have been, ha have, have been received, it's then possible for the receiver to take all the data in between those, figure out where it needs to go, and start applying it where necessary to fill in the entire datum as a whole, and then flush it out to a disk, write it to a file, email it. It's really up to the user implementation. But again, uh, three, the seed is used basically for three primary purposes. That is to generate the start, start sequence, to generate the stop sequence, and then to apply that random number as a sequence number for any of these packets that are traversing the network here. OK, so moving on, data filters are basically filter plugins that can range from anything, encryption ciphers, to any sort of data encoding, such as you know, Base64, MIME encoding, or perhaps just a relatively simple ASCII translation. Uh, data filters are not necessary. We've gone ahead and implemented them in our version of the protocol, just as a matter of upping the ante here, upping the security. Data filters are actually applied over the entire datum before it's chunked into packets. So if you've got three packets CDNS, what we're going to do is package them together, and then we're going to filter them wholly. Now, the only exception to this is the start and stop sequence. For simplicity purposes, so that the receiver is more able to recognize these packets as they come in, we're going to go ahead and filter the start and stop sequence separately. They're actually filtered on their own merit. Again, that just makes it easier on our part to notice them as they are coming in on the receiving side. And finally, uh, Luna, the Luna Correspondence Protocol is multi-tiered security. That is to say, even if the Luna Correspondence Protocol is cracked, flawed, or some way rendered useless, your data is still protected by the lowest grade of encryption used in your data filter cipher here. So let's say we wanted to use like RSA 496-bit keys as our data filter, and then you're going to send this data over the network using our protocol. We're guaranteeing you at least that security, folks. That means if our project is completely irrelevant here. Your data is still encoded. You're still relatively secure. Um, data filters can be used to incorporate any kind of en encryption filter. It could be RSA, Blowfish, Twofish, uh, Onefish, Gefeltfish. It's really up to you. And on for some so to summarize what we're doing here as far as the uh, anonymity and efficiency is concerned, we're basically taking data. We're trying to use the entire internet spread out as wide as possible to distribute this data and have it collected back at a particular source. Okay? We're having it go to a pool as opposed to a specific source. Again, because we want both parties sending and receiving to remain anonymous. Okay? And again, you don't need special client server software. Ours is actually a uh, packet parsing and creation engine. Okay? And again, you're using it these uh, methods that a lot of other things uh, uses what I might be familiar with, the spoofing, the relaying, and then the host level transmission using the permutation engine and uh, some of the other stuff we've incorporated as well as the filters. OK, and then finally, we discussed achieving security via the Luna Correspondence Protocol, the mathematical permutation function, packet level transmission, which actually happens over OSA uh, layer 5, OSI layer 5, I'm sorry, for those of you familiar with the OSI model. And then we finished up with covering data filters, encryption filters, and encoding filters. OK, well. You guys are probably wondering, oh, this, this sounds pretty uh, complicated, and stuff like that, or uh, whatever, or where's the proof? We have working software that proves this. And uh, sometime shortly after the conference, we're going to post it on SourceForge once they get their, their act together. And uh, you guys will be able to download it from there and see, uh, see how it works. Just another note, our software is completely open source. It is released under the GNU public license. Richard Stallman is our hero. OK, so where are we actually going to use such a complicated scheme in our own communication? We'll start off with a really extreme example and a uh, purposely patriotic example. Uh, 
let's say we have a CIA or American operative in China or Afghanistan or wherever, and he needs to get mission critical sensitive data through a network, through a hostile, paranoid military uh, network back to either the US or some arbitrary host where it can be used to prevent something from happening or you know, complete a mission. Well, obviously he's gonna incorporate the most extreme values and extreme uh, implementations of these methods here to avoid all costs, like life and death situation, not just for himself, but possibly millions of other people. Um, of course, he's gonna encrypt this data, he's gonna reorder it, he's going to uh, permute it with the false data, send it across the network at any random delay that is gonna be feasible to the particular scenario. So obviously, if it has to get across in a week, something's gonna happen a week from now, and he needs to warn us about it, he can't set the delay to happen over a period of years. Okay, there's not many situations where you could. But that's gonna be the most anonymous, most likely to go unnoticed. So what we're gonna do is, again, he's gonna apply all the methods here, put it on a delay that's pertinent to the time frame in which he needs to operate under. Yeah. Now more day-to-day -day example, something that some of you might wanna use or average person. A scenario where you need, you have a problem with, say, uh, an employer, something else you need to go over their head, you need to communicate anonymously to uh, complain while they're monitoring your network, okay? There's a lot of other applications, you, like anonymous Dropbox, uh, relays to uh, specific servers that are collection data forms. We've, there's a lot of them that we're gonna get into uh, a little bit later on, and also on the data that's gonna be posted on the SourceForge site. Um, however, you can make this as secure, or you know, again, as overt and insecure as you need it to be. Okay? You can add or remove any one of these components to complete your transmission. Uh, our software can implement everything, but you can do it, again, at your own pace. There's not any way to sit down in a terminal and be anonymous if you don't know what you're doing, okay? You can't, you know, anonymous and stupid don't go together. You have to understand how the network works. There's no tool that makes up for lack of knowledge or poor implementation, okay? So using our software intelligently or devising a plan of your own intelligently implemented with the 30 spread in here, you will remain anonymous on the network, okay? And now for some more creative implementations that we've come up with. All right, so, so basically, uh, just like to let you know, we at Chung's Donut Shop believe in your right to have privacy, and um, I don't know about you, but I don't like when I'm trying to talk to my friend about something important, and then somebody's eavesdropping or something that you don't want somebody to know. Um, this applies to everybody, so we believe that you should be able to stay anonymous and have freedom of speech. So this protocol implements that and keeps it going. Um, here's, an, here's an example of how you could use our use our uh, protocol. Basically, let's say for instance you want to go to an area coffee shop, one that may provide wireless internet, either paid or free, you would be able to implement our software on that network without having to have an IP address. This, this basically what you can do is when you're on the network, you can passively sniff the packets. As long as you're on the network, that's all you need to know. So if you're on the network, you have our software, your communication is possible, no IP address, your identity is hopefully kept a secret, and if, if that fails, you always have the cryptography on top of that, whatever level of encryption you have. So, just to let you know, I'm gonna pass it over to Keith for another, another aspect of that. Okay, finally, and we're almost in somewhat way, shape or form ashamed of this, but due to the vast random data dispersal nature of our project, Luna Correspondence Protocol can be used to distribute a nasty, nasty denial of service attack. So for packet kitties out there like you, you, and packet princesses such as you, please do not affiliate our software with any sort of these attacks uh, that was not the original device meaning or basically what we intended to use this project for. So again, uh, we'd just like to emphasize that it is possible to launch a massively distributed DDoS attack. Uh, however, don't do it. Just, uh, Please. <laughs> we like the internet, please don't break it. All right, there's some other talks uh, going on today and uh, the rest of the con. Basically today you got government IP tapping happening uh, with Jay Balu. I'm probably gonna check that out. It should be pretty good. It has to do, it has to do somewhat with, with this concept. Tomorrow on Saturday we have Air Snarf with uh, Beetle and uh, Bruce Potter and then on Sunday we have Jeffrey Poussin presenting technical security. So these are all things that have to do 
with your right to uh, have an, you know, be anonymous and uh, your privacy and how you can do things. So recommend that you check those out. Also, we're going to add the AirJack projects. If any of you want to check it out, uh, AirJack's actually been used in some of our testing, and it makes a lot of very interesting things possible. Um, it's a really great subject, and you guys should check it out by uh, abandoning. Okay. Finally, we'd like to make some acknowledgments here. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the infamous Mr. Tang for some mathematical genius guidance. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us today, so he's not sitting in an audience per se, but he is vicariously watching us somehow through a closed circuit television somewhere. Uh, second, we'd like to acknowledge Douglas Adams and the meaning of Life 42. Please rest in peace. Uh, we use some of his concepts, uh, strikingly, believe it or not, like the finite improbabilities, yada, yada, yada. And then most importantly, thank you all for the support. Thank you very much for showing up today. We really appreciate it. Okay, now we've come to the Q&A portion. So, this man right here. Okay, for those of you who couldn't hear a uh, gentleman here, we're asking how the software deals with ICMP packets being lost or lost packets going across the network. And, and it's most extreme implementation, it doesn't. However, there's a filter and there's a set of rules that you can apply to any one of these. One of them being a pseudo TCP that has sins and acts. Um, how, and this is encapsulated within the encrypted data. This is part of the payload of the packet that's already been anonymously sent via Luna. Um, however, if you're doing sins and acts, it exponentially increases the amount of traffic going across the network and across the relays. And you're going to have the same packets going across back and forth several times. And they may be flagged as you know, suspicious traffic. But that's why we chose not to address it here and in the software, but you can do it with the data filters. Luna by itself does not deal with the issue of drop lost or somehow corrupt packet. It, we do not have like a TCP style uh, protocol wrapped around it. So in essence, uh, we base this, we call it like finite improbabilities. There's really no way for me to know that you did receive all the data. I mean, that, that, that is the downfall of the basic Luna correspondence protocol in its own. There there's really is no way. I mean, you may never receive the data for all I know. It's true. That's very true. One lost packet could very well invalidate all the packets. Uh, we, there's no way for us to know if you did receive the packets, therefore there's no way of me retransmitting them, and therefore the receiver will just be listening and waiting for this packet to arrive. And again, that's under the most extreme anonymous secure implementation of what you'd want to do. Um, you can, again, when we've tested it and it works, the uh, sin act scenario with tunneling basically a pseudo ICP within the Luna packet. And you can thereby guarantee that it came from one source or the other. But yeah, that's uh, For anybody that has any questions, please come up here and just ask on the mic uh, so that everybody can hear. Yeah, that probably expedite things. Actually, sure. Both of you, actually. We've got some. You guys can just all come, whoever has questions, and come and ask and we'll answer. Line. It's not a good idea. With some of the um, features of IPv6, is this going to be able to work over that? I mean, the security, it's IPv6, the encryption, the... Uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it limits on um, doing the spoofing technique you can do in IPv4. As far, to address that question right there, it's, we haven't been able to really test it over IPv6 distributed over the entire internet because it's not really implemented yet. Hasn't, it hasn't been tested. It yeah. hasn't been tested yet. But basically, software can be modified. And ICMP, again, to address this, ICMP is not the most critical component of this. It's just the relay. It's anonymizing your host. Uh, one scenario that was brought up was uh, on a local network, just streaming out from box to box like a lo no, uh, local network segment, to uh, hide the data in like a UDP packet for uh, mask as syncing your time servers. Or even somebody mentioned hiding at Shoutcast, a lot of different implementations. If you have an organization like the NSA or Echelon, somebody who has access to maybe all of the routers on the internet or most of the routers on the internet, if they were to implement something where, I mean, there's been sugge things suggested where they would start logging every packet, which is ridiculous because they'd need a hard drive the size of a football field. But if they started implementing something like logging the CRC or checksum of every packet, it seems like it would be possible to backtrace simply by, even if the packets are encrypted and out of order, if you know that this meant that a bunch of uh, anomalous packets went to this destination subnet and 
that they all had the following checksums, you could just match up the checksums across the network until you narrow down to the originating subnet. And that would at least tell you perhaps what subnet it originally came from. Not necessarily who sent it, but uh, it seems like you could narrow down the origin that way if you had that much information. To answer, that's a very good question. It's one that we've actually been asked uh, several times before for uh, people we discussed this with. The main goal of creating anonymous communication is not that we don't want to have something that's a standard Luna packet or something be flagged as a Luna packet. That's kind of where the permutation routine Wait, and hey, goes. Uh, let me cut in. I think what he was saying was uh, all the packets going through on uh, through one subnet. But the thing about Luna correspondence protocol is that when you send the packets, you're using multiple relay hosts, which are multiple subnets. So even if you did have, like what he said, the NSA and everybody logging everything, you, it would be hard because your packets could be spread across a period of like a, like 100 subnets. So even if you were logging everything, you have to go to those 100 subnets, log everything on the 100 subnets, and then try to order the packets in the right order. Then after you get all the packets out in the correct order, then you have to decrypt them. So. Uh, Basically, I think I mean, that's I was what he was talking about. So we have more relay is, hosts, chunk, and that, that's that. So to answer his question, it's, it's almost so impossible. And also, if it's an anomalous package you're looking for, again, a lot of ICMP traffic is anomalous by nature. Uh, arbitrary applications create arbitrary data within the ICMP packet to calculate uh, what's going on in the network. We have yet. Um, we offer you to download this software, try it, see if you can filter out your Luna packets. We haven't been able to. Um, and again, this is through good practices of doing it. You're not keeping the same seed. You're not keeping the same values on the session by session basis if you're doing your screwing yourself. Just as if you're using the same relays and a lot of the same stuff. You want to keep it moving yeah, to question. address the next All question. Right. Um, so you said that the packets go out in uh, kind of a random order, but there's also the start and end sequence that the, the, re the listening host looks for. Mm -hmm. So do those have to be in, in received in order, like the start sequence oh, and then? Nice. No, in fact, the start and stop sequence can be sent anywhere within the order because the receiving host is left just receiving all traffic as it comes in. He's looking for these two packets. When they do arrive, be it the first two, the last two, anywhere in the sequence, when he does have them, it's then possible for him to set them up, see where they exist in the sequence of random numbers, and then figure out where packets need to be injected in between. See? So the receiver is unable to order them until he has received both of them, but they can be sent anywhere within the stream. But he would have to keep listening, that's correct, okay, okay, if, okay. if there was a delay or they were sent last. Thank you. This, is, uh, this protocol is on the other end when you receive, it's very passive. That's why you can use UDP packets on a local network without even, have to, even having to use any relay hosts. All right, two questions. Okay. The first, uh, you said that even if the protocol is flawed, uh -huh. that the, the encryption done through one of the data filters over the, the data will still be the absolute minimum security. How do you deal with key distribution? Excuse me? How do oh, you deal with key I'll distribution? Um, the key distribution basically is transmitted in the same way that the seed initially was. It's up to the two parties. You see, our protocol is basically interested in keeping, a, we call them like host key files. But so if you have to do key negotiation before you can send data, how do you do the anonymous data transfer? Well, that's what I'm saying. Beforehand, it would be maybe a matter of you and I physically meeting, and we'd write down our keys, or we'd transmit them, and then we both have them. So that when we separate, or when, when you're in Europe and I'm over in Asia somewhere, we then have them, and we are able to communicate. You see, it's, it's truly up to the two communicating parties. Um, it could very well be that maybe we have some sort of a challenge response protocol to send the keys, but those are all susceptible to man-in-the-middle style attacks, and it's not very secure. Well, the, any any key exchange protocol will be susceptible to man in the middle. Uh, exactly. So are you basically just saying key distribution is not part of our protocol? It's Deal not part of our protocol. Own? It's, a, it's the, implemented on, okay. on however you wish to do so. Okay. Actually, encryption as a whole is part of a data filter set that we chose to implement in the software, and it's a really good idea. For Again, you don't need a, you know, PGP for POP3 to work correctly, but it's a really good thing to have in your client. Now, obviously, if you've got to do session per session keys, it's not feasible to call you up on the phone and say, here's my key, hang up, and then start transmitting but it over if, the network. But if, if you're trying to transmit, it, transmit data anonymously to somebody, how do you do any form of key negotiation beforehand? Uh, you, Again, this is going to be up to the individual host. No, no, no I, think, individual I, I think you're trying to ask, if I don't know you and we both have the software, how do we communicate? Well, we don't. Okay. I, would, I would have to know you first, and we would have to establish beforehand 
you know, the keys, the seeds, and whatever else is necessary to decrypt the data. We would have to, it would all have to be established at some point. Yeah, first. that's what I was going to say. It doesn't have any negotiation like SSH or anything like that. It's not like a chat client in the sense that I can search for other learning users. But that's Sending a really, that's ICMP a really good idea. People, it's a great question. Thank you. Sending the ICMP to people who aren't expecting it is more of a denial service attack than communication. So you, you kind of want to know what's going on between the two parties. Now, you said that you have problems if there's egress filters. Mm -hmm. Have you considered any kind of implementation of a client and server, a server on the internet, where you would, in essence, be able to overcome that because you know the server's connected well, somewhere where they're not sure. ingress filters or egress well, filters? Basically, if you're in a situation where you cannot spoof your IP address to get it across your uh, network or even your MAC address, um, there is, and that's kind of how the, uh, and it's probably going to run out of time before we can really discuss it in depth, how the HTTP relay works and you know, free internet access. Basically, you don't have to have anything besides these parsing engines on either end and know what this initial value is to use Luna in its base form. But you can implement whatever you want over it. We have a situation where you can actually have a, uh, a second host, maybe your home computer, you want free wireless at some coffee shop that's all over the country. And you basically can send this data out to listening party on, at your own network. They can go and execute commands on your behalf, relay this data back to you. Uh, Really, in situations where you can't spoof, you could have another host do it. But again, that host is just implementing Luna, and you might as well just tell net into it or shell into it, SSH in, and run Luna from that local server. Okay. There is a non-spoofing option for our protocol, and our, our software, software implementation. Hi. So given a shared key and a common set of random number generators, two parties can communicate, scrambling the data and the data stream in a deterministic manner. That's great. Yeah. So why is this any more secure than using the same random number generators and the same shared key to just generate a one-time pad? A, a one-time? A one-time pad. Use, pad. Your random, or, or, use your random number generator, generate a long stream of random numbers. Okay, yeah, exactly. And XOR that with your data stream. Why is, oh, why is Luna any more secure than a one-time pad? Well, we don't, we don't have to do that. Well, in effect, we are doing that, but we're generating them off the initial seed and then matching up later. It seems like you're doing a lot of extra work for not much extra security. I mean, the, the ran oh. Their protocol certainly is great. That's great. But the actual scrambling of the data doesn't seem to be any more, doesn't give you any more effect than a one-time pad. The way we can answer this is how you actually implement the reordering. Like basically, we're telling you how our software does it. But you can actually reorder it just that same way as long as the data is not coming in order. As long as, as long as you're applying the methods behind it, the logic behind how you're doing it, you can implement it however you want. You can implement it with a one-way pad. Uh, you're, you're correct. I mean, basically, no. you know, of course, which I, I totally see what you're saying. The thing about Luna is that it's very passive, so you can be on a subnet, send from one subnet to another. That's the thing about Luna. It's not just the idea of reordering the packets, because that would be the same as, like, cryptography, right? So the thing about it is you're on a sub, two different subnets. You're able to communicate to each other. And then you have the different relay hosts you can bounce from. Just, so just, that just adds on top of that. So, but even if that's you know, done, then you still have the cryptography. Just briefly, rather than store all of the random numbers, in other words, like generate a pad, as you called it, of random numbers, we're just storing the seed and then generating the random numbers later. Right, it can happen either way, but we're storing, we're storing less initially to generate more later, if that makes sense, rather than store everything now. And, th and then at least with the seed, we can now say, instead of giving me this set of 10 random numbers, let's, let's uh, you know, evaluate this function 20 times and then give me this set. So they can always change, see? And we could, we could do like a roundabout thing or we could just, you know, for simplicity's sake, never reuse the same random number and just keep going down the stream, but, but keep a placeholder and know where we are every time by storing one piece. Can you go into a little more detail about how exactly you do the reordering of packets? Are they somehow marked in some way, or are you just depending on the order in which they're received so that if they were scrambled somehow in time when you received them, that would hose the encryption? The packets are reordered based on a sequence number. The sequence number is set to the random generated number coming out of the, the random function, basically. So, so we have a, we have so okay. So basically, we have a seed. Uh -huh. We stick the seed in through the random number generator. Right. And on both parties. Right. Both parties are then generating the same random numbers in succession, one after another. Right. These numbers that are being generated are affixed as the sequence ID in all of the packets. The, se the sequence so, ID. I, I'm sorry. It's part of the IP header. 
okay. in the packets. Right. So we're setting the sequence ID as that field in the IP header. So when the packets come in on the other end, he's able to then match it with the same seeds or with the same random numbers that he's generated. The IP ID? Sense? Just the so receiving end. Because sequence numbers are part of TCP. So I'm wondering, is it the IP ID? Oh, no. We're using it. Uh, we're writing straight IP, straight to the straight to the link layer. This right. is this is the sequence number in the IP datagram, the IP header field. The IP ID. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay. Hey. Oh uh, yeah. I was thinking. Oh, hold the mic closer. Oh, your protocol seems like it would uh, it would make a lot more sense if it were implemented in like a many to many sort of thing, where you have many source hosts. The data is physically broken up a, like across all of them. And you know you have many receiving hosts because other than that you still have a single oh, yeah, endpoint on either end. Uh, we are doing the multiple sending yeah. portion of that by yeah. basically spoofing various networks. However, it, in well, a sense, we're doing the multiple receiving because we're spoofing various uh, targets as well. See, so if we can if we can say that the receiving end can reliably sniff on an entire class B network then what we can do at the sending end, the transmitter, is we can spoof all of that. And it is quite possible that if you had two machines set up, they can both sniff that same class B network, and they both were aware of your user credentials, the seed and everything else, that both parties could sniff that traffic. So it could very well be a many-to-many -many relationship. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And in the base implementation, we basically want to avoid a scenario where you had to have client service software or have one, you know, an extra machine out there to do your dirty work for you. You're using the internet as is to do your workload. You want people to uh, you know, be able to communicate individually without the need of a third party or third box that they may have a shell account on, whatever. You want to avoid creating that pattern. You want to avoid that third host. Because again, if you're constantly going everything through this third host, you're creating another pattern, another point for which you can be traced. Now again, you can apply these to anything. Any means of communication. It doesn't have to be ICMP. You know, it could be UDP. You know, somebody even talked about embedding it in like a shoutcast server. A lot of different ways to do it. But the main thing you need to, the main point you need to touch on is you want to avoid the creation of patterns, and you want to look logically at every step along the way. If you've created, you've got this server that's an inter intermediary, a bunch of different servers across the internet that you log into, shell into, whatever. You're creating another point for them to find where you were from. You know, it's another box that has your information on it, and you don't want that. Okay. So I think we've got time for one more question. We got the five minute signal. So anybody else? Any further questions? Here we go. Okay, so you're you're bouncing the ICMP packets across something on the internet. Does that have to be something you set up, or can it be anyone? It's basically we're relaying it through an ICMP echo message. We can relay through anyone. Anyone relaying ICMP echo traffic, whether it's Google.com, MSN.com, Yahoo.com, and the slew of other hosts, out there that do it, we can all relay over them. It, there is no. There's no, you know, hacking or owning of machines out there on the network to establish relay hosts. Relay, whether it be your personal Windows machine at home, you know, your Cox relay at home, or your business line, we can relay over it. Okay, so that brings us to the end of everything. Thank you guys very much once again. Yeah, ch okay. check out SourceForge. Uh, uh, SourceForge again. SourceForge right now. Some of you may know SourceForge is uh, currently. Uh, upgrading some servers and some hardware and uh, doing a couple things that aren't allowing us to upload the software at this time. Um, and again, a lot of this, we all work and it's a spare pro you know, time kind of project, so it's going to be released in a timely manner, but again, it's not going to be a constant project. We're going to be updating it as we can. Um, he just asked if it's uh, Windows or Linux based. Or uh, Right now, it's uh, Unix based. However, there is a plan to export it out to a DLL to be able to be used by uh, the Windows layer. But right now, we just want to make sure we had everything done and working in the Unix implementation, because that's what we all run, and we want to use it ourselves. Okay. So, yeah, thank you guys uh, very much. Anybody, Enjoy anybody the next.